Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Cross Country Super Podcast Series. And this episode is proudly brought to you by Zaga, generating stable, fixed income style returns with an investor first approach. Why zig when you can Zaga? And as always, I'm joined by Gemma Sanderson over in Perth. How are you, Gemma? Lovely to see you. Good to see you too, Darren. I'm um, pretty good. It's starting to warm up. So uh, it's, you know, a bit nicer from a perspective over here. So yeah, I'm I'm great. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. We're, our weather's sort of been fluctuating a little bit. So we thought we were over the worst of the uh, cold weather and we had a couple of really nice warm days. And then of course the cold weather came back. So just a little bit of consistency might be nice, but yes. If- Hey, if that's the worst thing I have to deal with in my life, I can't really complain. Yeah, it's a good first world problem to have, isn't it? Absolutely. Now, speaking of um, speaking of issues in my life, uh, I did admit uh, during the last episode that uh, we always, for, for people who are new to the podcast and, and to regular listeners and viewers as well, we always try and work in some sort of pop culture or common culture references and and the two we like to include are either probably from the simpsons or star wars because we're we're both pretty big fans of that and failed in the mission dismally last time because didn't mention either of them so i've made a conscious effort to to start today so that we can just get it out of the way and get it out of the way So I heard a good joke and it's a bit of a dad joke uh, and a shout out to Peter Burgess because he thinks that he's the king of the dad jokes uh, if he's listening. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, I I heard a pretty good one. And uh, so uh, the joke is how many stormtroopers does it take to change a light bulb, Gemma? Right. Okay. I'm not, I'm not even going to go there. There'll be some quip to like you said it's a dad joke so i'm just waiting to do a fake laugh so go on darren tell us none because they live on the dark side oh my god (laughs) that's actually not too awful (laughs) i thought it was pretty good but then again i don't like corny jokes like that but to tie it into today whoever's listening we don't want you to be on the dark side of super, so we're bringing you these podcasts to hopefully enlighten you about some of the issues. And today's issue is actually going to be something that um, is very, very, very recent, and that is the announcement to address legacy pens- pensions. Sorry, I can't get my words out at the moment. And uh, I know that if you speak to most technical specialists in the industry, this is a massive bugbear of them. I shout out to SMS Association CEO Peter Burgess. He, I know this is one that's really, it's, you know, it, it's 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 an itch he can't scratch. I know Mark Allen from Mercurium. This is another one of his pet. Bugbears, yeah, 100%. Oh, I've yeah. heard Meg Heffron go on about this <laughs> issue for a long time as to how it will be resolved. Well, actually, something's dropped to... um to hopefully help resolve this whole legacy pension issue, which has just been, you know, hanging around, hanging around. You know, we've kind of been waiting for the other shoe to drop because they did make an announcement they were going to do something about this several budgets ago, I think it was now. Oh, more and, than several, really. Yeah. So every single legs and reds. Pre-COVID. It's a pre-COVID budget. Oh, it, well, there you go. Pre-COVID. There you go. Yeah, that's telling you what it is. Yeah. Seriously, every legs and regs update that you go to at any conference you know it's usually a little bit formulaic about what's happened you know what this will mean and then the last bit is what hasn't changed it's usually what hasn't changed and two of the things you can tick off always is the legacy pension thing hasn't come about and neither has the change to the um objective of australian no the australian super fund oh yeah you know the 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 residency rule. The residency side. Yeah, yeah that residency so, side. That's that, annoying as that well. That continues, yeah. and I, we don't have any news on that. But we are going to talk about legacy pensions. And I thought, just as a bit of a refresher, Gemma, what are we talking about when we talk about legacy pensions? 
Right. So um, a legacy pension. So I remember when we used to do the structuring for legacy pensions, and that was back in RBL or reasonable benefit limit days. And so that was, uh, and the uh, these a lot of these legacy pensions, it's colloquially the term used for a market link pension or a term allocated pension or the TAP, you know, you turn on the TAP. Um, and uh, then we had complying lifetime pensions or fixed term pensions that were more like those defined benefit pensions set um, in a self-managed fund. Now, it wasn't uh, back in uh, 2005, the provisions came in to say that a self-managed fund could no longer provide one of those defined benefit pensions. And the benefit of, of a defined benefit pension at the time was the ability to compress the capital sum down to a much lower amount for RBL purposes. So the RBL reasonable benefit limit was like the um, old school transfer balance cap of sorts, kind of, sort of, not really. So a lot of people for both RBL purposes, but also for Centrelink. So if you had a complying lifetime pension uh, within a self-managed super fund, then if it was set up before a particular time, it was exempt from the assets test, the underlying assets. And then there was um, generous income stream treatment for those. Uh, so that was the complying lifetime pension. And then the market link pensions or the TAPs, they also had concessional assets test uh, treatment. It was 50% of the capital that was assessed towards the assets test. So the, the reason behind people setting them up was generally uh, a lot of the time for RBL um, and then also for, for assets test and Centrelink purposes to um, to receive a, a higher age pension. Then in 2007, we had, uh, and now I'm showing my age, um, we had a big change to super where the whole tax-free, once you're over 60 of payments came, um, was introduced, no more RBLs. And so if you had set up one of these pensions for RBL purposes, it became not really that worthwhile to have it in place anymore because the challenge with them was uh, you set an income amount at the get-go um, of the with the lifetime or fixed term ones. And then that was indexed each year. And that was your pension payment for the year. So there was zero flexibility with respect to, to those accounts. And so a lot of people restructured those accounts to uh, so if they, there was a, another pension called a commutable lifetime pension, which was um, assessed towards the lower RBL, I don't want to go into RBLs, whereas a complying lifetime pension was assessed towards a higher RBL. So with the commutable one, you could just basically restructure that into an account-based pension. So that was pretty straightforward. Um, with the complying lifetime pensions, you could only restructure that into a market-linked pension um, in 2007. So that was the, sort of the first side of things. A lot of people decided not to do that and they still had in place a complying lifetime. And also for Centrelink purposes, a lot of people kept those lifetime pensions in place. Then we fast forward to 2017 with transfer balance caps, etc. And because of the nature of the transfer balance cap, the limit on how much you could have, um, you know, getting that pension exemption. And then you had your market link pensions and your complying lifetime pensions had the special value and classified as cap defined benefit income streams. So now we're just talking complexity over complexity. And again, the reason for those, uh, those pensions being in place, they're just not fit for purpose anymore. They, um, we've moved on a couple of times from what they were set up for. And what we're also finding is, so for starters, they're uh, complex. People don't really understand why they've got them. They, um, there's no flexibility um, in them. And the concern of a lot of people at the moment. So if they set these up before 2005, so they would have been, uh, had to have been at least 55 at that time. So this is, you know, 20, get my maths right, 20 years later. So they're, they're starting to nudge, you know, um, late 70s, if not older, um, and they ha are having estate planning concerns with these accounts. And if yeah. you've got a complying lifetime pension and either your spouse has died um, and it was reversionary or it's not reversionary, when you die, that whole account forms part of the reserve 
within the fund. And then you've got those reserve allocation challenges attached to it. And then you've got the other consideration with that estate planning is lack of flexibility. Some people, they're having to keep a self-managed super fund in play, even though maybe the assets have gone down. They don't want to be managing it anymore. Mum and dad might have lost capacity, all of these other considerations, but they're non-commutable income streams. And so that was the, the challenge that came through. So really that's a bit of... Um, history 101 yeah. of what a legacy pension um, is. I did notice that when you referred to the 2007 changes, they were the Peter Costello changes. And do we even dare to mention that they were the simplest super changes? Yeah. After you mentioned that, everything seemed to be so much more complex. And we always say that there's nothing simple about super, but they were the simple, the so-called simplest super changes. But it was better than RBLs. Like RBLs were awful. Um, not to yeah, say, you know, the transfer pretty... balance cap is a better version of an RBL. But, yeah, if I reflect back on the RBL rules, don't want to talk about it. Thankfully, that predates my coverage of this sector. <laughs> not, not by much, but it, I just missed I just missed when those rules. Oh, you missed out on so much fun, Darren. So yeah, much fun. No, but, but it's all right. I keep yeah. I keep having RBLs referred to, you know, oh, I remember the times when there were RBLs and they were a nightmare. So I, I get that, that they were certainly not a great solution and managing them was very, very difficult. But of course, with anything, Gemma, we, we touch on different aspects of super and probably one thing that made this whole situation a little bit more complicated, you, you did touch on reserves a lot of people created reserves to actually fund these pensions, um, specifically to fund these pensions. And, and of course, what's made it even more difficult, apart from the, the actual pension structure itself, which is already complex. And as you touched on, a lot of people don't understand how they work. And a lot of people don't even know why they've got them. Mm, 100%. But, yep. then, but then it was further complicated because the ATA came out and, and pretty much said that we don't want reserve to operate in an SMSF anymore. The only exception to the rule was the contributions reserve, which isn't yep. technically really a reserve. reserve. Yep. So it's more of a suspense account to to time um you know the the tax treatment of a of a concessional contribution if, if you want to if you want to sort of juggle your affairs around and, and make that more advantageous but outside of that the ato basically said because there used to be self-insurance reserves mm. investment reserves the anti-detriment reserves the anti-detriment yep. reserves so there were a whole raft of reserves that were available to smsf trustees and the ato came out and said look we don't want any of them anymore so get rid of them we're not going to allow, we don't want them in your SMSS and we're not going to basically allow them. Now, then came, so, okay, the edict comes down, but what do we do with the reserves? Yeah, so how do, how do we get rid of them? Want, because yeah, it's all well and good to yeah. say we don't want to see them, we don't want them, they're not appropriate in an SMSF. But if you've already got one and your income stream is requires one to be in place, then how do you get rid of it? And 100%, that was that was a challenge. That was in 2018 that that um, regulator bulletin came out. I remember it was March 18. I was in Bali and this came out. I'm like, oh, of course, something, you know, exciting for a loser like me or a nerd like me comes out and I'm sunning myself. Anyway, we digress. Right. So the but challenge you're with- you yourself and you still took note that this came out. Yeah, I know. That's a wow. bit grim, isn't it? Anyway, <laughs> so with um with the reserves, so <clears throat> I'll, I'll go back again to move forward. So back in 2007, because of the benefit of super, like super went from um, you paying tax on income streams coming out um, to it being tax free if you're over 60. So that was amazing. And then of course, if you could, you could have your whole account in pension phase and get an exemption. So it was just, it was, it was awesome. Right. But then we had the contribution limits coming through. So as a result of that, um, there was caps sort of put on how you could allocate a reserve because you didn't want the ability to just be able to say, right, well, let's allocate this reserve. So reserves are taxed at 15% on earnings, whereas if you're in exempt um, pension, 
then you've got 0%. So they did want to limit the ability for you to say, right, here's reserve all to Darren um, and you're in pension phase and it goes from 15% to zero. So they they put in place this allocation limit. So if you allocated 5% or more of the member's account from a reserve, then um, so there was a couple of things. One was all allocations from reserves had to be fair and reasonable across the, um, the membership. And then if they weren't, then that allocation, uh, so if either they weren't or if it was 5% or more of the member's account, then it counted towards your concessional contribution cap. So got the contribution caps weren't enormous um, and still aren't. So it, it, that, that doesn't give you that much to work with. So unfortunately what that meant is even though the tax office said no more reserves, and, and sure, people weren't adding to reserves anyway, um, but it then really limited your ability to, to really deal with a reserve um, from that perspective. So that, and you know, of course, the, some the, of these reserves were, were quite sizable. We're, we're not oh, talk, massive. So we're not talking about, you know, it was just $50,000 or something no. like that. And again, you touched on, Gemma, when, when the announcement was made to try and get rid of these things, I think the con Con concessional contributions cap was only twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. So in the context of a huge reserve, um, and twenty twenty five thousand uh, dollars coming yeah. into play, like and and the five percent, like that's almost like drip feeding. Oh, it's 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 um you know, it's barely drip feeding um for for the the big ones <laughs> so you know i've got some clients and they've got like millions of dollars sitting in their reserve accounts and their biggest concern is uh how do we get it out when they die um and so that continues to be a, an ongoing conversation so you know that the the reserve position is um, you know, a, another thing that has arisen because of these um, announced changes this week is the allocation um, from a reserve, a, a, norm, a normal non-pension um, reserve. And instead of it being assessed towards the concessional cap, um, this is got it assessed towards the non-concessional cap. So it allows perhaps some more meaningful allocations to come through. Also, if you did allocate and the person was in excess of their concessional cap or they any allocation that was counted as a non-concessional contribution was excessive because they've got more than 1.9 million, then the excess non-concessional contribution mechanism and refund mechanism would then kick in. So it's a way to get the... Um, you know, the tax office doesn't like reserves. Reserves are taxed at 15%, as I mentioned earlier. That's still a better tax rate than uh, anywhere, you know, outside super yeah. um, from that perspective. A reserve isn't subject to Division 296 tax. So it's a way to park some money in super at 15% and you don't get hit with that. If you've already got a reserve, you can't add more money to it. Uh, yeah. So it's there's benefits of it, but the biggest downside being obviously that it gets trapped in super. And one of the biggest things with the reserve uh, that regulator bulletin was the intergenerational wealth transfer and not wanting money to remain in super. And it's interesting when you have a look at the explanatory statement, which of course I have in front of me because I'm that sort of person, and they make a comment about it saying... Um, so the use of the non-concessional cap mirrors the consequences that would arise if amounts were to be drawn, withdrawn from the super system, gifted to an individual and contributed back into the system. It provides fair outcomes while mitigating the risk of intergenerational wealth transfer within the SMSF system. So what they're, that's really what they're trying to, to sort out. Um, so that's, that's really the position with reserves. So general reserves, so an investment reserve, uh, if someone had built up an anti-detriment reserve, uh, those sorts of things, there is a mechanism now for that to be managed. Obviously, there's a tax outcome. I'm not going to go through the excess non-concessional contribution um, rules. I'm pretty sure we've got a, another podcast out there that, that goes through that in a bit of detail. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a good outcome from that perspective. And then, of course, that's on the back of an actual legacy pension amnesty that um, that this was really from. However, the other yeah. thing I just want to chat about before then is, so in 2019, I think it was the budget that said we're going, because of all this, it's complex, not fit for purpose anymore, all of these things, we're going to put in place an amnesty. It's going to go for two years 
um, that will enable people in these legacy pensions to restructure them effectively back to uh, their own accumulation or an account-based pension uh, without any issues. Uh, now, the reserve side of that, however, was if there was a reserve attached to it, that allocation of that reserve to the individual's account would be hit with 15% tax. So that was a big ooh from the industry at the time. Of course, we hadn't seen anything to come with that. Um, now, the the outcome of that, annou that, that announcement as well was the transfer balance cap position it wasn't going to be amended to allow for it. Um, and likewise, the Centrelink position was that it would lose its assets test exemption. So uh, so there were other considerations as part of all of that as well. Um, and then we, so yeah, we've been waiting. So it was 2019. We've been waiting for some time for, for this to, to all come through so we could see it. But we have had, and I think it was in 22, 21, 22, where they sort of went halfway there with the transfer balance cap uh, in terms of, so, you know, I can talk about this underwater. Right. So with the transfer balance cap issue, um, we always had the consideration. So a market link pension or a complying lifetime pension had a special value attached to it for transfer balance cap purposes. So what um, happened, if it was a lifetime pension, it was the annual pension in the 17, 18 year multiplied by 16. And that capital sum was the credit in the transfer balance account for that particular individual. Now, if that ended up being an amount greater than the 1.6 million, then that was okay because you got a notional, that became your notional transfer balance cap or your cap defined benefit balance. Then for market link pensions, it was the remaining term of that pension multiplied by the pension payment for that year. So again, um, some if they, if they were set up for Centrelink purposes, they would have been fine for transfer balance cap. Um, but if they weren't, then invariably that resulted in a much higher cap defined benefit balance. Uh, but it meant that with the uh, market link pensions, as an example, all of those assets were um, eligible for the um, exempt current pension income. But then the flip side of that was you could only have an amount um, from a cap defined benefit income stream, which is what these were, that was tax free in your own name. And that was initially $100,000. Uh, so it was a $1.6 million transfer balance cap divided by 16. So the general TBC divided by 16. So it was 100 grand initially tax free. Then if you received an amount from a um, the, this particular income stream above that 50% of it was in taxable at your marginal rate. And that's been indexed twice. It's now about $118,000. So that's the transfer balance cap. So there was always this issue if you, um, after 1 July 17, if you wanted to restructure one of those accounts for transfer balance cap purposes, it went from being a cap defined benefit income stream to being a sort of normal income stream for transfer balance cap purposes. So I'll use the example, and these will probably be bad numbers, but let's say your notional transfer balance cap for this was um, you know, 2.5 million. So you were over it, but didn't matter. Um, and even though it was 2.5, say the market value of the assets supporting that pension were $2 million, because that's often how it worked. Then if you were to restructure your $2 million pension, on the 1st of July 17 or at a, in a subsequent year, then that $2 million would then count towards your, so you'd stop that pension and start a new one with the $2 million because you could do that under the market link pension provisions. But that $2 million would then count as a credit towards your transfer balance cap. And you would end up with an excess then because that would be assessed towards the 1.6 and you can't commute that excess because it's non-commutable. So people didn't restructure these accounts because of that issue and uh, because otherwise it's 400,000 accruing at excess transfer balance um, earnings and, sub and subject to tax. And the first year is at 15%, but subsequent years are at 30. So mm. we didn't want to deal with any of that. Right, I'll take a breath. So... Well, the first step that was made in, I think, 21, 22 was to allow an excess transfer balance to be commuted from one of these pensions to mitigate that. There was also a lot of argy-bargy about what the debit value 
of that restructure was. Now, um, with a market link pension, it was different to a complying lifetime pension. With a market link pension, you ultimately the pension payments that have been received between 1 July 17 and the date of the restructure, that reduces your available transfer balance cap down. So we had some clients where they had none left effectively. Yeah. Um, if it's a lifetime pension, it's you still get your 1.6. So the pension payments received over time it don't, don't matter. So, you know, you can see, you know, you made the comment before about um, Peter Costello's Simpler Super. And uh, yeah, we still, it's, it's very complicated. And we, you know, again, if we can deal with all of these, then it makes things um, a lot simpler going forward for, for those people. Yeah, I mean, how can you not understand that the average punter out there, the average SMSF trustee, could possibly get their head around? Mm. I mean, it's diff- it's probably difficult enough to get their head around the original structure, but but all of the implications of the subsequent changes has just made this a complete dog's breakfast. Oh, 100 um, percent. Yeah. From and how do you even unravel that? Uh, if you're, I mean, it's it's a little bit different for for technical people like yourself, yeah. Gemma, who, and of course, we both sort of live, breathe, eat, and sleep this sort of stuff. But if you don't, and of course, trustees aren't. This isn't consuming their whole life if they're running their self managed super fund. How do you get your head around number one? So where am I at right now? And number two. What am I supposed to do about it now mm. to find a solution? And of course, as you said, that was kind of like a half measure. And yes. it still it still was like, yeah, we're, we're kind of still in limbo here. We don't actually know what the full resolution is. But it's a good segue to, to discuss now what the proposal is. It, yeah. it, it obviously is still a proposal. I know that... Um, uh, the consultation period, I believe, is going on now. But but what exactly have they announced to try and address this long-standing legacy pension issue? So the proposed um, draft legislation, or the draft legislation, is I'll use my Monty Burns. Excellent, um, because <laughs> there you go. We'll it, both boxes now. Yeah, two two references. <laughs> so it's uh, it it has a there's a five year period uh, to restructure. Now, in my view, you know, like, I don't know why there needs to be a time limit on it, and I can go through the reasons for that in a moment. But so five year period to restructure. Um, I mentioned earlier that if uh, the original proposal was that if you had a reserve that you allocated as part of any restructure, it was hit with 15% tax. That is not um, on the cards now. Uh, So that's a great outcome. Uh, If you allocate from that reserve either to the accumulation account of the individual or to start an account-based pension, that doesn't count towards concessional or non-concessional caps. So that's fantastic. Uh, So it basically allows someone to uh, commute their legacy pension either to accumulation or an account-based pension um, or, well, once it's in accumulation, it's fully it's fully accessible so they can take it out. And that has been the clients I've dealt with where this is a concern, it has been I don't want an amount trapped in a reserve that then the family has to try and deal with when we die. Yeah. So they've that's been the, a, a big driver for them restructuring. And then the other thing was like, these are too complex uh, and I don't like it being in a non-commutable structure where, you know, I'm 85 now or hmm, however old, um, you know, I'm questioning, is a self-managed fund right for me? Is super right for me? Do I just pull it all out because I could be one foot in the grave, one on a banana peel, and I'd rather just pull it all out, mitigate death benefits tax and then move it into a structure outside super and and at least then it's it's simpler then I can manage the wind up perhaps of the fund etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's um that has been a, a a great outcome so it is very much excellent in that perspective <laughs> is it's 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 addressing what was originally proposed with extras attached to it so five years um no 15 percent tax on a reserve allocation uh, and then it, it, the other outcome is that change in a normal reserve allocation 
being assessed uh, any amount above fair and reasonable or 5% or more is non-concessional um, contribution, not a concessional contribution. Now, I think that the genesis of, so this has been on the cards and Treasury has been looking at it, um, probably hasn't been a massive priority for a bit, but because of the reserve treatment, um, sorry, because of the Division 296 treatment of a reserve, perhaps it's really brought it to the front of mind because a reserve doesn't, is not um, part of your total super balance. So it's not subject to Division 296 tax. It is a way to keep money in super beyond generations at 15% tax, which has been the biggest um, consideration there. So really positive from that perspective. Now, my challenge with the five years is, or two years, uh, or having a time frame, is that there's no change to how the transfer balance treatment will occur. But I think that that is okay in terms of that won't necessarily be a prohibitive consideration for people not using this. It's the Centrelink side. So from a Centrelink perspective, a lot of people have been benefiting from an assets test exempt or partially assets test exempt income stream since before 2005. Uh, I think it was 2004 from a Centrelink perspective, September 04. Now I'm definitely showing my age um, that, that those rules changed anyway. Um, so they, they've benefited from that assets test exemption all the way through. And uh, if they restructure this, they'll lose that exemption. Now there are also debt recovery prov provisions that allow Centrelink to say, well, if you restructure that now, then we can deem that you never had the exemption back a bazillion years ago, but they had, there's a legislative instrument that says they'll effectively waive it. But, you know, you just have to be aware of that. But just losing any, uh, a full pension, for most people, as long as they're getting a partial pension and they get the healthcare cards and things like that, that's that's worthwhile. Um, also, sometimes what we encounter is the the income that they're having to receive each year, which might, which might be indexed. It's no longer really enabled, like it's it's not enough potentially for them with their age pension to be able to meet living and health expenses and things. So this is another way, even though you might lose your full age pension and might only get a part or none now because it's not assets test exempt, um, then the extra income that you'll and the flexibility for you taking out whatever you want, um, will be able to offset that. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, obviously a good result. I think well, certainly, I'm sure you've heard this in, in plenty of circles, Gemma, is that uh, maybe the inaction came about because they figured that there's not too many people affected by these legacy pensions. So again, it's like uh, such a small cohort. Why would I? Why would I? Why is it a priority? It's not a priority. Yeah, make it yep. a priority when I've got other bigger fish to fry. It's yep. an interesting point you make about did the... Uh, Division 296 tax accelerate this this mm, situation yeah. or, or this resolution because obviously then maybe we can capture more tax because more people will potentially be pushed over the, the $3 million threshold. Yep. Ulterior motive, of course, but look, to be really cynical, let's face it, they wouldn't they wouldn't probably fast track this unless there was something in it for the government. I mean, that, that just seems to be the way that they're doing policy right now. I know that's a really cynical viewpoint um, for me to have, but it there's a lot of evidence sort of to back that up. But also, why do they have to put a time limit on it? Well, yeah, that's, that's what I... Um, I guess they're trying to prompt people to really take action. Um, and, and if everyone can take action and do it within that time frame, then that's going to simplify a lot going forward. But as you mentioned, I'm like, this isn't an, an enormous cohort of um, people that are in this situation, but it's enough that it is having an impact and it is a lot of older Australians. My concern with the time limit is I can see for that Centrelink purpose, people would be like, no, nah, I don't want to restructure my account because I don't want to lose. And, and some of these accounts, you know, they could be north of a million dollars in assets sitting in there that's exempt from the assets test, sure, they're only taking a small income each year. Um, and even 
because every year the actuary, an actuary has to do a report to tell you how much of that, let's call it million dollars, is um, eligible for exempt current pension income. So you might not be getting the, the exempt, full exemption on that, depending on what the annual income is and how old you are and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but a, a lot of the time losing a tax concession isn't as high a priority as maximising your um, Centrelink. So everyone's got that different priority. So if you end up restructuring and you lose your Centrelink, and especially if you um, can't get the uh, any uh, concession cards, so healthcare, healthcare cards, that can be a big determining factor. Now, the outcome of that could be that you've got um, Homer and Marge. I'm nailing this references today <laughs> homer and marge and um homer's like no i don't want to lose the age pension so they keep it chugging along he could be in his 80s or 90s when he dies and that's in yeah. 10 years time and marge is sitting there as the reversionary beneficiary of that and she might be thinking oh well of course i'll restructure it but she's outside the time frame so she can't do it um so I, I can see again why they might say you've got five years and if not it the you know too bad too sad to to perhaps force people to do that because of that ultimate outcome but at any time along the way I feel like someone should be able to do it but perhaps it's a bit like do you remember project do it you probably don't so there mm. was um the tax office had it was called do it which was declare offshore income today as a good acronym oh, and right. um and it did people were like oh if I declare this um I, there's no there was no um part 4a going back historically it's just for the period I think it was a four-year period that they would the tax office looked at and then they'd be like bring if you bring it all on shore so it's then under the Australian tax net we'll look at the current year in the last four and then we'll ignore the previous bit so whether they're just sort of saying now you know this will be the prompt for people to go if I don't do it now or in this five-year period then we've got money trapped in super that is a a disaster then for the family to deal with. So, you know, that's what that looks like. This is a bit of a philosophical one that I'm going to throw out there, but do you think there's a real danger? I mean, you've gone through the history of this really well, but is there a huge danger of people who are making policy now not actually understanding what the history is? So then when they actually come to the solution, you haven't taken into account everything that's gone before and everything that goes with it, a little bit exactly what like what you said then with the interaction with social security mm. um, benefits. And we all know that, I mean, you can downplay this as much as possible, but we both know that um, on the ground and anecdotally, people love their social security benefits. Mm. I mean, do 100%. I, I know, I know we haven't been talking about this in this context, but do I need to mention the seniors the Commonwealth Senior Health Senior's Healthcare Card. card yep. You, you, you don't. You don't go anywhere near. You don't go anywhere near that. Oh, if you even if you if, recommended to someone that would lose yeah. that, you would yeah. be blacklisted. It's yeah. it's. But it it has such substantial benefits with um with what that looks like, and it's interesting you make that comment about understanding that history because, uh, you know, in the, a lot of the the bits and pieces I do is a lot of training to uh, other firms and I talk about RBLs and I say you know back in the day when um, pension payments were potentially fully taxable if you were over your uh, over your RBL you had an, an excess um, allocated pension so all the all your pension payments were taxable at your marginal rate you didn't get an offset like all that and they were like what what do you mean Wow. Huh? I don't understand because <laughs> they've been, you know, that was that was 20 years ago nearly. Um, I remember it like it was yesterday. And and so that whole there's a whole generation of advisors that don't remember that. Not that they should. I'm not saying you should understand the history of all this sort of stuff. But then so that would also translate to a whole generation of, you know, the the lawyers and the boffins that are having to actually draft this legislation to perhaps not quite understand where it came from. And to, you know, we love a good digression. Um, in the, our previous podcast where we spoke about the UK pension transfers, that was legislation that was in place from 2004 that just hasn't been updated. And yeah. so the context of... 
So in 2004, it made perfect sense yeah. from that perspective. But we've had so many different evolutions of our way our super system land and landscape works that again that legislation is no longer fit for purpose but you need to understand what that purpose was to to then figure out how you change it now so in this context they actually haven't done a bad job but they've but again we're not looking at Centrelink or transfer balance cap um, and the impact of that and I think that transfer balance cap side is a bit frustrating with restructuring a market link pension um, the fact that your debit uh, value, so this this was, there was some argy-bargy about all of this stuff happening um, where an alternative interpretation would have just, you know, addressed it perfectly fine. But anyway, yeah. I'm, a cyn- I'm also a cynic. Um, <laughs> and uh, so we, we move on. And so as a result, we had a change in legislation about what the debit value was to then determine how much the, how much credit was available or how much cap was then available. Um, so, you know, that's because it's been seven years since 1 July 17, then a lot of people have used up their some of their available transfer balance cap in that perspective if they do a market link pension restructure. But again, the motivation for these is um, it's less about ongoing tax concessions it is more about estate planning and flexibility and with that estate planning piece they might lose out on exempt current pension income on an ongoing basis but if they can save their children and their beneficiaries hundreds of thousands of dollars in death benefits tax uh, by paying being having the ability to pay money out before death then you know that that's actually a bigger incentive and that is more than a, the an annual ongoing if they live for 20 years sure <laughs> they're gonna um, be worse off but mostly they um, you know are looking at that as the estate planning consideration yeah fair enough and I don't mean to be patting ourselves on the back but anybody who listens to our discussions and as you mentioned we do go as we like to refer to off piste a lot yep. a lot as to what we start talking about and what we end up talking about but that actually does i think highlight the fact that if you don't have a history and you don't have a grasp of how these whole things interlink then that that's a danger because the whole reason why we do go off piste is because of all these other issues that come into play when you just make one change like that, but we should be, we should be thankful for mm. small mercies. And of course yes. a two year window is much better. Uh, sorry. A five year window is much better than a two year window. And yeah. I would even suggest Gemma, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we talked about how it's only a small cohort who do have these legacy pensions. And I would actually suggest that, that the structure is so, I don't know, I don't want to use the term complicated, but maybe sophisticated from its origins and probably complicated to where it is now. I would suggest that most people who have one would probably be advised anyway. Yeah, that's 100%. Because to set them up, to have set them up to start with, that's right. Yeah. Although I have encountered some situations where they were advised and perhaps because it was 20 years ago, that was, you know, that was initiated by perhaps a financial advisor um, who understood how those pensions worked and was licensed to provide that advice, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or again, uh, really like niche ad- advisors at that time, even who understood a defined benefit pension within a self-managed fund. So this is where you've got, you know, like you already mentioned, Meg, you know, Heffron, the actuaries. So the actuaries obviously were, were aware of this year, Acuriums, um, Act 2, all of those guys. So um, again, it would have been a niche group then. And then it's just like, oh, I don't want to say plotted along, but, you know, the you, you take out your absolute required pension each year and the money gets invested and you might have moved to a different financial advisor a different tax agent and so now that they are looking at it going oh we'll just do what was done previously and we'll flick it to the actuary and they can look at it and they're not aware of the ability to perhaps restructure or um, again that history like you mentioned so now they might not be advised um so they, you know, that's a consideration. And obviously, you know, the whole point of this is we're talking about self-managed super. 
and there's plenty of non-SMSFs that have these annuity and uh, legacy products in them where it's also available for them. And sometimes those were set up, again, they could have been a very much a set and forget, done for Centrelink. Uh, it's externally managed by your AMPs or your challenger or the, um, you know, it's not that many um, of the players that would do those anymore. Externally managed by then, you get your monthly pension and it's, you just, because you've locked that in, that's it. So there, you know, those sorts of considerations too. So it's, mm -hmm. it will be, and, you know, if you look at the class report that came out this week, 72% of the people that they have on their, um, that they look, that use class uh, of the funds that use class are unadvised. So that, you know, even in itself is a, a consideration. I think it was 72% only glass. Yeah, it's, a, it's that, that, definitely is a is a worrying trend mm -hmm. i'm sort of probably being optimistic and, and hoping that most people who do have a legacy pension are still advised and um just to that point uh if they are an established advisor for for you know a significant period of time in the industry i think they would be really keen to get on the front foot to say that mm, oh totally. this has dropped we've got to move now so um yeah or we got to wait maybe, for the parliament yeah so maybe we, not um, so so much to light the fire under yeah. their under their backsides to to say that oh you've only got five years to do this i think that um most people who are aware and who are advising clients i reckon would be just on the front foot immediately about this sort of thing to say that right this is what we've been waiting for for ages yeah Let's we've been waiting five years for this five years goes like that Let's just get it done and then it will simplify everything. Um, you know, we are talking to people at the moment about, again, restructuring some complying lifetime pensions because of that reserve and estate planning issue. So this is fantastic for those people um, because we can now remove the legacy pension from the system. But they don't want a self-managed fund. You know, mum's lost capacity. So it's de it's down to the kids to be managing it. They don't really understand it. They don't want to. They just want it simple. So this way they were going to restructure to market linked and then look to roll over to a public fund. But now with this, we can just restructure um, back to accumulation and just get it all out of super. And then that way, at least it, as far as they're concerned, the management of the money is easier. Again, mum's not well, so her, you know, time is is quite short. They just want, they just don't want to have to deal with this sort of thing at a later point in time because it's complex and then you overlay all the beneficiaries and other family members to it, you know, that becomes a challenge as well. Who could who could blame them for not wanting to deal to deal with this anymore? I mean, it's basically just hanging around, and it's 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 a thing. It's really a, a thing from the past, isn't it? Mm. That, as you said right at the outset, outserved its purpose. Yeah. So, I mean, the logical thing would be okay. Well, how do we either make it workable or just allow it? Let, let's just get rid of them because they're, they're not really relevant anymore. So I, I couldn't imagine one person out there um, given the, the aim of simplicity that they wouldn't jump at this opportunity. As I said, if they're advised, I know that, um, you know, this is, this has been something that the industry has been hanging out for for so yeah, long. 100%. As I said, yeah. legs and regs always one thing that hasn't happened yet is the, the dealing with the legacy pensions. Well, the next legs and regs I go to, that will be changed now because no doubt we'll be talking about this. Gemma, is there any um, detail? I, I've only really read this very briefly, so I'm, I'm not 100% across what the, the ab absolute ins and outs of the announcement are. Is there any uh, issue with the reserve allocations with if it's not specifically for a person? Oh, so um, you're talking about like the the member or the pension member? Yeah, the member. Yeah. yeah. So if um, so if the reserve, so basically the way that these legacy, you know, the complying pensions are, technically 
the whole account that is, or the whole asset value that is in there. So let's call it $800,000 is sitting in there and being invested to provide a regular pension of, let's call it, no, it's, say it's like $35,000 at the moment. So that's being invested in order to support this $35,000 indexed. Now, every year the actuary will say, right, well, that's for um, Gemma, she's 85 now, so her life expectancy is X. The rate of return on this is Y. So of that 800,000, what really, so the whole 800,000 isn't, um, really Gemma's pension capital because Gemma just gets $35,000 yeah. index yeah. for life. So the yeah. super fund has this 800,000 available to provide that. So what the actuary will say each year is, okay, of that 800,000, how much is really needed to support this given the life expectancy and returns and indexation and blah, blah, blah. And how much of that is sort of surplus to requirements. Yeah. So, um, the, the, it all gets uh, accounted for differently uh, in funds. So sometimes you'd have the whole amount as a reserve. I very rarely see that. What mostly happens is that 800 would be classified as the complying pension for Gemma. Um, but then the actuary says that of the total, you know, 35% is exempt from tax and the balance yeah. is taxed at 15%. Sometimes it might say, right, well, whatever that 35% ends up being as a as a capital sum, that's the complying pension and the balance is the reserve. So as part of all of this, if Gemma decides to restructure, she'd be able to commute her um, her pension and if, if that reserve, so what happens then is an actuary would give a, undertake a calculation to say what is the actuarial value of that pension. That's how much um, that can be commuted. Um, as a, like, go just from, the pension to say Gemma's account and then there'll be an amount above that as that's this reserve and that reserve will be able to attach to um, Gemma's account and it will still um, retain as a pension reserve so it, it's not like if Gemma stops that pension so say you've got I don't know Again, 300000 that might be what's required to meet the pension liability and 500000 that's surplus in commuting the pension that 300,000 goes into Gemma's account, that 500,000 is still considered to sort of be attached to that and can be allocated out with it. Does that answer your question? In a very confusing yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. And I suppose we'll see it all play out um, mm. in real terms when, when we actually, or when you guys actually start to manage these things yeah. out. Uh, and that I was said, actually clarified a bit too. So oh, having it? a look okay. for, um, you know, to in the, again, I've got my, and it was a nice short six pages as well. So I'm not it as defines well as you, are, you are. I don't have that in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> it defines meaning of pension reserve um, as well. So it says to you know subsection eight to avoid doubt. Um, if it, it covers off on the bits that I just mentioned. So it's again. I feel like the motivation for this is to get these reserve accounts sorted out so they're not lurking in these funds, simplify things on the back of Division 296 coming in. And so, and then also that intergenerational wealth transfer. So by allowing people to attach that pension reserve um, to accumulation, and then that can come out of super, so it's no longer getting the concessional tax treatment, or you can start an account-based pension if you've got transfer balance cap available, or it can stay in there. But at least when the person dies, it's got to come out. And as opposed to that reserve where it gets to stay in there, plus then, so that's the estate planning side. So you, lots of money won't just be trapped in super for the longer term. And then the alternative uh, or the other considerational benefit of doing this is you then don't have all these big reserve accounts that could be exempt um, or they wouldn't be counted as total super balance for Div 296 purposes. Now, as I, as I said, I'm not across all the detail. Have they made any indication in the announcement as to when it might? I, I said, I know that there's a consultation period at the moment and obviously we have to go through that whole process, but have they made any sort of um, incl inclination or indication when it might come into play, like once the bill receives 
Royal Assent at a, a particular time? Have they, have they have they nominated a date as to when it might take effect? Basically takes effect as soon as it gets Royal Assent. Right, and then okay. that five-year period is from there. Right, so, um, so, yeah, the day after this instrument is registered is the... Um, okay. It's the effective date, and that's when your five years ticks on. Um, you you know, often they do say you know the first of the next quarter or one July, yeah. blah blah blah. Yeah. Uh, but for this, because like straight in, like why wouldn't you just? It, it, there's no benefit of of saying okay, we pass it today, we'll make it effective one July twenty five. It just doesn't. You know, there's no. And and also you'd want it to happen sooner rather than later. If we got if we have Div two nine six tax that's supposed to start one July twenty five, you'd want people to be able to avail themselves of this straight away in the lead up to that. I would expect as well. Yeah, absolutely. But you're right. Consultation. Hopefully the feedback will be this is great. This is great. Yeah, this is great. And they're like right, tick tick tick, off. And then we get to deal with it from that perspective. Well, at quickly. first glance, Gemma. Uh... I couldn't see a reason why anybody would really start to raise serious objections mm -hmm. around what to do. As I said, the industry has been waiting so long to try yep. and get a resolution to this issue. And it seems to have ticked most of the boxes that, that people would have wanted to have addressed. And then I, some. Yeah. yeah. So I don't, I don't think that even the harshest critic would make a submission to say that. No, I don't like this because um, to sort of well, hold Well, the thing up with that, that is process. if you don't like it, don't don't use the yeah. amnesty then. That's up to you. You know, you can you can make that call. So it's um, – but I, I agree with you. I think most of the consideration, if people who are advised, they'll be jumping on it straight away just for simplification, flexibility. It is – and I've probably said this in like too many times now – the, the people that have these pensions in place are older Australians that, it you know, having that, like perhaps even running a self-managed fund, like the example I gave earlier, it's not appropriate. Like they're incapacitated, they're in, they're in care or they're in their 90s. And so it's... Well, it's too it's too complicated. Yeah. They're, they're not interested, even if they're in their 90s and they've got full capacity or even if they're in their late 70s, they're just looking at this. Super is complicated enough as it is with transfer balance caps and some's exempt and some isn't and all these sorts of things that they have to be aware of. And if you've, like, attached this to, like, it just, we like you said earlier, we are in this every day. We're in the trenches I've been doing this for a long time and I remember like this all being set up, um, but it's just, it's too complex when you overlay it with all the other things, not fit for purpose. Uh, it's just, yeah, I think most people will just be like, like again, hallelujah. It's been um, when we get five years, no reserve allocations whacked at 15%, a change to the way that normal reserves get allocated. Like it's, it, I feel like it's a massive win um, for the industry and I'll applaud Treasury on, you know, getting this, getting this done. And if the prompt for it was because of Div 296 tax, then, you know, at least we got, at least it's, it's, um, it's happened uh, from that perspective. Yeah, well, the timeline, it stands to reason the conclusions that you've drawn, obviously, from the coalface of dealing with people as well. But if you look back to, to when some of these things were put in place, you're talking about 20 years and, you know, slightly beyond maybe, um, definitely the the demographic of people who were having mm -hmm. self-managed super funds and setting up self-managed super funds back then would probably have been predominantly retirees i would yep. i would imagine and yep. Yep. if not uh part of that's that cohort obviously being pre-retirees who would definitely be retirees now we're talking about 20 years ago what are we talking about six 60 year old 65 mm. year old maybe 70 year old you're right yep. if you just do the simple arithmetic add another 20 years that's mid 70s 80s yep. you know do you want to be dealing with this stuff I don't think so. And their kids certainly, like they might, they no. don't appreciate why this is in place. They're having to pick it up, especially with parents going into care um, incapacity. It's too complicated dealing. And, you know, that's that's a, a emotionally, it's a the toll 
that all of that takes, it's pretty rough. So this is, again, a great outcome. Yeah, uh, and if I could be really, 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 really cynical, which obviously I can, anybody who knows me knows that I can be that. Um, We've talked a couple of times about the consultation period. It seems that the government's modus operandi with consultation periods is that they don't really consult anyway. (laughs) It's just a token thing. But in this instance, if they follow that, yeah. it actually could lead to a good result. Mm. So as I said previously, we should be grateful for small mercies because we could be getting a few, regardless of the ulterior motive and regardless of whether or not we think the process is robust and hasn't worked that well in the past. But we celebrate. It's a great announcement. Celebrate those small wins. Hopefully we can tick this one off and we'll never have to talk about legacy pensions ever again. How good would the... you know, as I said, small cohort, but I know that that the technical community and all the SMSS specialists and experts out there, they'll be doing cartwheels about this stuff. Yeah. In fact, I'm surprised that we're not hearing the champagne cork still popping (laughs) after the original announcement was made because this really is something that has been, you know, a thorn in the side of so many people just, just wanting to put these things to bed and just saying, look, let, let's let's just find a good solution for it. Yeah, 100%. So, you know, again, I feel like this is a great outcome. So what a positive note to finish on because, yeah. you know, we've, we've run out of time again, Gemma, as we usually do. Standard. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's, this is a victory. This is, yeah. this is fantastic, you know. Just like when West Coast won that grand final in 2018 <laughs> against Collingwood in the final minutes, blah, blah, blah. Final minutes, and it was it was just about the the last, well, one of the last kicks, like the third the last kick or something. Yep. Yeah, um, I was there. Pretty it amazing. Was pretty amazing. Yeah. Not for the Collingwood supporters. So no, no, but they had some joy but, last. Nah, year, so. they've won. They've won plenty of flags, haven't they? Sixteen flags they have. Yeah. They're, they're equal, I think, with Essendon and Carlton for the most. Some of the most flags won at six. I'm pretty sure it's at 16, but they won it last year anyway. So yeah. you can't feel too much. Sim- oh, I'm not a Collingwood hater, but you can't feel too much, um, you know, brief for them. They won the flag last year. I mean, North hasn't won a flag since 1999. So, but that's another world of that's hurt. That's another, but, that's uh, a whole nother. <laughs> If I could find a solution like the legacy pension for that for North Melbourne, I'd be really cheering about that. And West Coast at the moment too. So anyway. But that's a story for another day. That's a whole other story, which we have discussed at length. It is. We've ticked so many boxes today. Boxes today, hundreds. You know, so many Simpsons references. And I started off with a Star Wars thing. You know, I I feel like we've really done some solid work today. And I'm going to, I'm going to add another, this, these regulations are the droids we've been looking for. Wow. There you go. That's a dad's joke too, isn't it? I can't top that. That's really good. We've top and tailed it. So what a great way to finish. So, look, thank you very much again, Gemma, for providing your time to do this podcast. As usual, we've had a lot of fun. Well, I have. I hope you've had a lot of fun as well. Always, yeah. Nerding it up, like you say. Love, love a good nerdy. So thanks, Gemma. And more importantly, thank you to all of you who are listening and watching this podcast. We hope you've found it interesting and we hope that some of you are cheering about this development as well because it is quite significant. And as I always say, if you are accessing our podcast or any of our material uh, on YouTube, please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. But other than that, Thank you, Gemma. Thank you all for joining us. And we'll see you and present to you on the next episode of the Cross Country Super Podcast. Have a great day. Bye for now.